Cheers. Welcome to Culture Night. Where each week we're doing fancy wine and watch movies that are in some way culturally significant. I'm Andrew. And I'm Sarah. And we are back for season four, episode seven. And thank you to anybody that is still tuning in on YouTube or Spotify or Apple Music or oh, Apple no, Music or Podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, for those watching, I had the bottle of wine displayed. He usually does a grand reveal if yes. you don't watch, so but that's okay. you didn't see that. <laughs> um, anyways, thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. And we are ready to dive into another science fiction movie tonight. But before we dive into science fiction, what are we drinking tonight? Tonight we are drinking the 2020 Fat Boys in Vendel from Tobin James. Um, it, we have had a, several Fat Boys in the past, and I think we've loved them all. They're just the big, which they say, mm-hmm. um, loud, slightly obnoxious uh um wine or something like that mm-hmm. so go ahead and give it a smell Ooh, big and fruity yes but nothing like too specific and it doesn't linger mm-hmm. like it punches you and then it's gone i must get a little bit of floral from it too yes like rose mm-hmm. a little flowery what? slightly more acidic than i thought but also it's a whole lot of flavor, it really al- juicy. It also kind of weirdly has like th- like a leathery taste to me, not texture wise. Mm-hmm. I didn't get that. I got a lot of acid, and then I got like a whole bunch of like it's very sour, like a uh, really ripe pineapple. Um, it does a little bit taste like a generic like gummy bear, mm-hmm. a of, with, with a little kick to it. Yeah, it's a whole lot of like really ripe fruit sweetness there. It is good though. So, fantastic wine. Can't wait to see our thoughts after the movie. Um, and with that, we're going to jump into a little bit of podcast business. Is there anything significant for podcast business tonight? Just a little bit of significance. Oh, can't even say it. I'm so excited. <laughs> a little bit of significance. So mm-hmm. although we have missed it a little bit as far as when this actually happened and this time of recording this and mm-hmm. when it will come out, we have just recently celebrated our one year podcast anniversary. Oh man. So cheers one to us year old. for doing this for a whole year. Honestly, mm-hmm. if you told me that we would stick with it this long, I, I would be surprised and not surprised, but mostly surprised that we're still here, still doing it. We should look at the stats. I feel like we've made it much, much longer than the average podcast. That's true. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't come in with those facts. Mm-hmm. Um, as of this episode that is out now, we have released 42 episodes. I believe four of those are special bonus episodes. Mm-hmm. And then in addition to our four seasons, um, the first season was a little bit of chaos with just trying to figure mm-hmm. ourselves out. And I feel like we've kind of found a good rhythm. Yeah, moving into seasons and everything and mm-hmm. having our little segments as they've kind of grown organically, not trying to force anything uh, like that. And um, still have no sponsors. Tobin James, if you'd like to sponsor us, <laughs> feel free to you know hit us up in the comments or email or anything. But yeah, it feels like one year feels both too short and just right at the same time. Mm-hmm. I mean, and thinking about it, like we put out 42 episodes in a year, mm-hmm. m- maybe like a year and two weeks at this point. But that's, I mean, that's only 10 weeks where we didn't do it. And that includes like holidays and mm-hmm. just like living life that I think that's pretty darn good for mm-hmm. year one. For sure. And each one being, we've kind of found that sweet spot of hitting it right about an hour. Mm-hmm. Our, our bonus episodes are a little shorter because we don't do behind the screens or anything like that or look mm-hmm. back at the previous episode, but generally pretty good at nailing it. Mm-hmm. So overall, how are you feeling about one year of podcasting? Um, I feel like we have gotten into like a good groove. Like I said, um, it doesn't feel like it's a scramble with each episode. We just kind of have to follow the outline and, um, got pretty decent chemistry with my co-host. So that kind of helps. Um, (laughs) and yeah, I think we're definitely growing. I think looking back at our earlier episodes is pretty painful. Our audio has gotten better. Mm -hmm. The segments, at least I think hopefully have fewer ums and uhs or anything like that. feel like we've done a pretty good job at getting good flow. So Mm -hmm. I feel pretty good about it. Yeah, I mostly just feel really proud that we actually stuck with it despite living full other lives outside of this. And this is something we just do once a week. Mm -hmm. We've definitely streamlined streamlined the process a little bit more of editing and getting all of our outlines prepared for each episode. And um, Mm -hmm. I think we've kind of hit a groove and I'm excited for the next year. Um, And then just two quick questions before we move into our Slept On It segment. But what was your favorite movie that we've watched in the last year? I mean, I think highest rated was Forrest Gump. I had seen it before. I'm trying to think of like movies that I hadn't ever seen before. It's hard without like a list in front of me to think back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 42 movies. Um, I will answer and say that my favorite movie so far is Back to the Future. Um, I mean, I thought if Forrest Gump was higher rated. I think like the more I think about the scale, it's like really just about cultural significance to me and how much the it is referenced, how much other things it references and just more of 
that doesn't necessarily mean it's my favorite movie, but just how much of a like broader purpose does it have? Mm -hmm. But I really feel like I just enjoyed Back to the Future the most. I laughed the most. I loved the cultural significance of it. And I think I just feel like there's something so magical about the 80s in film. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I can't put my finger on it. And I think, I hope that in the next year we might get to dive a little bit more into the 80s specifically. But um, yeah, I think there's an unexpected amount of like recent callbacks we've seen just to that series to mm -hmm. just reference in everyday life that unless you're unless you've seen it you wouldn't pick up on it doesn't seem out of out of place but once since we just watched it so recently we've been really picking up on it i think my favorite my, I, i'll pick two one is the graduate we hadn't seen it before mm -hmm. um it was just a, such a wild ride it was our first episode um was it was really such a good great. one for our first episode i also kind of want to say the uh maltese falcon Oh man, I was about to say that as my least favorite one. <laughs> Just because it was such a different genre that we hadn't really watched before. And it was um, our in introduction to what Humphrey Bogart mm -hmm. and also the um, of picking up the calling things the dingus all the time now. That is true. We do use the word dingus. So underrated one there, I think for sure. Mm -hmm. I think Graduate more I enjoyed and was more of my favorite of those. The Maltese Falcon was just so hard to follow. Mm -hmm. Like I didn't, the story was just so hard for me that I don't know. I just, I couldn't I still, do that one. I don't know. I'm hoping to go back to the film noir again soon. Obviously, we have a whole lot of series or seasons <laughs> planned, but I would like to get back there someday. I feel like we get like two episodes into a season and we're like, oh, but you know what else would be a good season? Then mm -hmm. we start thinking about the next one. And then each season we, we keep being like, oh, well, we could also add this one more in there. And we could also, and then, then you think like, okay, by the time we get to that season, that's like a year and a half from now. And that's just the wild ride that is this podcast. We didn't podcast. have lives and we could pump out like a season in like a week's worth of nights. Yeah, I'd love to go through all these, but it's going to be a long time before we get back to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hate to break it to you. All right, and then one more question. What was your least favorite movie that we have watched so far? Probably Wonder Boy. That was the one with uh, our Wonder Man. It's called Wonder Man. And I was going to say, I'm pretty sure you're wrong because you say Wonder Boy every, every time, single time. Because I hate it that much. I won't, even, I won't even tell mm -hmm. it or call it by its right name. Um, I think that one followed probably by maybe Music Man. Yeah, I know you didn't like that one. And I think just because you built it up so much and I just I was, was, was I love it so <laughs> hoping much. for more. Uh, but I think those are probably my two least favorites. Um, I would probably say oh, Oklahoma never, was pretty boring for me. Never Been Kissed was pretty bad. Never Been Kissed was really bad. And um, Maltese Falcon. <laughs> I just didn't like that. And mm -hmm. I... I didn't say Blazing Saddles. I do I think I appreciate it a little bit. It was it's a lot when you're not prepared for it, but yeah. I think sometime we should watch it again mm -hmm, for fun. Now that you've had it let it you know, kind of soak in a little bit. Yeah, I mean from going from never having heard of it to <laughs> just being thrust into that. Mm -hmm. It was a lot, but I do I do definitely want to see it again. So anyways, we are looking forward to the next year. I also I, one more thing is I just feel I, for so long, I was so like, I don't want to watch a movie. I don't want to watch a movie. And now there are just so many movies I want to watch because I'm mm -hmm. seeing them all and not just like watching a movie like you do for fun. Like we're watching movies for this podcast. So we have to be able to talk to them. We have to be able, mm -hmm. to, we have to be able to talk about them. We have to be able to like call back things and pay attention and just really appreciating the art that is filmmaking. I just feel like I have this whole new perspective on it. And mm -hmm. I I'm so excited. Like you said, I wish we could pump out a whole season in a week and just sit down and like crunch out these movies, but we yeah. do have lives. So, and I think there also is a limit to how much we can possibly consume without it just kind of all bleeding together. Mm -hmm. We're still at the point where we can still uh, absorb the filmmaking experience and all mm -hmm. the cultural impact, all those little things as opposed to just sit, like existing throughout mm -hmm. three hours of movies. It's probably better that we wait a week in between episodes. Mm -hmm. All right, so that wraps it up. Cheers to one year. Thank you if you've been here for a while or since the beginning, or if you're new, welcome. Or if you're listening to this years in the future, welcome. And now let's jump into our slept on it segment for Jurassic Park. Um, so I gave it a 8.3 and you gave it a 6.2. Yes. Because your rating change after sleeping on it. Yes, it does. I'm going to bump it back to a five and a half. Five and a half? Mm -hmm. Down? Yes. Interesting. I'm keeping mine... Keep mine at an 8.3. After listening to like editing our last week's episode and, you know, hearing our thoughts and our discussions again, I really feel like it's just such a niche. And I, mm -hmm. I know that that's like, we're going to be the case with all the seasons and all of the things. And, you know, it did have a big impact on pop culture and like from a, like the sound quality, like the mm -hmm. audio and the animatronic CGI, whatever. I understand that it had a big imprint, but I just 
don't really want to ever watch it again. <laughs> and just like thinking about your rubric, like would I sit down and watch it? No. Would I pick it up halfway through? No. Would I just want to start it? No. Am I going to quote it? Probably not. Um, so the answer for me is the opposite for that. I, I If it's on, I'm probably going to watch it. I probably would like to sit down and mm-hmm. just watch it. Um, I like to quote it. And and I appreciate all that, but I, I think I was giving it a score because I felt like I should give it one and mm-hmm. not because like I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and watch it. Sure, I'm going to put mine up a little, I'm going to put mine up to an 8.7 actually. I think, I think thinking about the audio part and how now everything is like Dolby surround and everyone kind of does that. And it kind of set the standard standard for that and really push that forward. I, I think I'm going to put out a uh, 8.7. All right. Um, yeah. I felt really scandalous trying to knock it back, but I just, I, it's mm-hmm. what feels right today. Just a and dinosaur hater. I, I wouldn't say hater, just not my thing. Mm-hmm. All right, so now it's time for some fact snacks. Mm, I'm hungry. Uh, right? Get out your popcorn. Uh, so now we are going to kind of go back and talk about some of the things that we talked mentioned in last week's podcast that we did a little bit of research on, very light research. So it's just a little snack, a little bit of extra information about Jurassic Park. So something that we talked about last week was, was it originally supposed to be all CGI? Were there supposed to be, was it supposed to be all puppets? Like what was the in- intended plan for mm-hmm the movie and it was actually not supposed to be any CGI at all. And, um, all of it was, all of the effects were created by physical animatronics and stop motion was the plan. And most of it still was. Mm -hmm. Um, but I did find it interesting that the, um, animatronics were created by Stan Winston, who also worked on the Terminator and the stop motion was by Phil Tippett who worked on star Wars. So we have, you know, some callbacks, Mm -hmm. everything, some continuity between this season season is the most, as far as like callback references of, Mm -hmm. of, crew and um and just references within each other like sci-fi has been the most interlinked yeah. um and then also it um, george lucas's industrial lights and magic company was brought in on to do the special effects mm-hmm. and basically long story short one of the um people that was working for ilm george lucas's company um he was, he had been told like no CGI, don't do it. And he kind of like worked on a little bit of like CGI dinosaur and just left his monitor on and someone stumbled upon it. Mm-hmm. And then that's how they ended up actually ended using some CGI dinosaurs. Such a George movie. Lucas spinoff person thing to right. do. They go, no CGI. We don't want this. And he's like, I want this and still did it. Mm-hmm. And this is one of my other like behind the scenes facts too, is that, um, you know, for the whole, it's like, I think two hours and seven minutes. Mm-hmm. two hours and some minutes like not sure exactly how much but only 15 minutes actually show dinosaurs in it so and then of those 15 minutes um i think only four of those minutes are cgi the other ones are like the puppet puppets and the stop motion mm-hmm. so like cgi is, is very minimal all the dinosaurs in the distance mm-hmm. probably showing a lot of that yeah so the cgi was minimal but it also wasn't even supposed to be there at all and it um i mean it, everybody in the article that's quoted was like, you know, this is something we'd never seen before. And this, I just knew we had something really special. So mm-hmm. um, it is really cool to see how yeah. it affected that. I think stuff. it does make a lot of sense. That it's, there's a lot of crossover or like repeat, um, you know, people, filmmakers working on this. When you think that sci-fi was probably a fairly niche like segment at the time, really anyways, a bunch of nerds, they probably mm-hmm. all kind of communicated and worked together on a lot of these things or wanted to keep working on a lot of the various sci-fi projects, but also with a lot of filmmaking, they probably weren't, focusing too much on special effects or visual effects mm-hmm. for most movies, like something like when Harry met Sally, like you don't really need mm-hmm. that for, for a movie like that. Something like sci-fi, you're gonna need a lot of it, probably costs a lot of money to get those studios set up, set up. So you probably are going to then reuse a lot of the same people, same technology, mm-hmm. same studios to keep doing those same things. So it makes a whole lot of sense. Nowadays, there's probably a lot more options to do that, I would assume. I would imagine. And probably spread out a little bit more, but I totally see why we're getting the same people um, and influences throughout mm-hmm. the season. Definitely. But it was just really cool reading the article and being like, Terminator, oh wait, we just watched that. Star Wars, oh wait, we watched that too. And mm-hmm. just seeing how much it all connects together. Um, my next fact snack is we talked a little bit about Ross from Friends and his love of dinosaurs and just kind of, we, we mentioned him a lot in the last mm-hmm. episode, but something that we did t- um, talk about was, did he ever mention St- Jurassic Park? And I thought he could, but I just couldn't put my finger on it. And as far as I could find in my very shallow dive is that um, he, it's mentioned twice. There is almost like a cold open where he's in his classroom as a professor and he has this whole chalkboard of stuff written up there mm-hmm. and it just cuts to him saying, uh, and that is um, how I came up with the idea for Star Wars or for Jurassic Park first. So mm-hmm. he apparently claims to have come up with the idea for a Jurassic Park himself. He would. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, 
And I can also see him not letting that go. Yeah. Oh, 100%. And I mean, that clip was like eight seconds on YouTube. So it's not a very long clip. It's just mm-hmm. a quick mention. Um, and then there is another time where Rachel is trying to prove to him that Ross always has to be right. He like always insists on being right. And she kind of tries to bait him by saying, you know, Jurassic Park could really happen. And you can tell that he like wants to fight her on it, that it maybe really couldn't happen, mm-hmm. which kind of conflicts his, he, <laughs> he came really up with the idea. Um, and I mm-hmm. think it's, I was, I started to read a little bit on Reddit of people talking about like, he likes the idea of Jurassic Park being able to happen. I think he wants it, but he knows that that's like a, a pseudo science. Like it's not real, that mm-hmm. it couldn't happen. And it's just like an internal conflict that he struggles because he wants to be right. Um, Mm -hmm. so he does mention it and there was lots of talk too of like, can you imagine how much like, like Ross would have loved this coming out and like, hate that they Mm -hmm. didn't touch on that. Cause that would have been a really cool, like pop culture reference within the show that was its own Mm -hmm. pop culture sensation. For sure. So anyways, if you can't tell, I love friends and moving on from that, um, just a couple other behind the scenes things. Um, the back to the animatronics, the T-Rex model that they ended up making was 36 feet long, 18 feet tall, and weighed 1,200 pounds. Jeez. According to the one article I read, mm-hmm. maybe fact check me. Um, and I also saw somewhere that they maybe had to like build a new building or like a, modify the building that it was in because it was so big. Mm-hmm. Um, and it also was not waterproof. So obviously they're shooting all of these scenes in the rain. So every mm-hmm. night they would have people like with fans and hair dryers literally like squeegeeing and blow drying this thing. <laughs> Jeez. Didn't think about that. And it, it's those stories where I'm like, filmmaking is wild. So he's at 18 feet tall. So basically like two stories tall. Mm-hmm. I wonder how accurate that was to, if they made it like fully to scale or they made it slightly larger for impact or mm-hmm. slightly smaller for, I don't know, maybe like shoot a bomb into the ground and have it send an image up to your four pixel computer. And maybe you can see exactly yeah, like how big the yeah. dinosaurs are. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, yeah, it'll tell you exactly those things, the shapes and what it was, what it, what it was eating and how it hunts. Oh man. Um, and then my last note is just another fun um, behind the scenes fact is Wayne Knight who plays Nedry, is that his name? Mm -hmm. Um, Apparently when the uh, whatever type of dinosaur squirts him in the face with the purple stuff, Mm -hmm. it dyed his skin purple and he showed up to Seinfeld. Oh man. (laughs) To shoot his scenes. And they had to use like a ton of makeup to cover up because he couldn't get the purple stuff off. Mm -hmm. And he like is telling them that. So like, he was like, you know, like I have to go shoot these other Seinfeld scenes. Like, are we done with that take? And they're like, no, you're going to need to do it again. And like, (laughs) just had this like purple dyed skin for for a week (laughs) (laughs) so that was just i thought that was funny and um i feel like those stories are the ones that like really you know you're like oh jurassic park but then you hear stuff like this and it just kind of brings it Mm -hmm. back down to earth just a little bit if it's stained his skin like that i'd hate to like actually get that in my eyes right yeah i think i think it's like uh for the special effects still seems like it'd be pretty I, I'm pretty sure there was also a quote there someone told him like make sure you close your eyes next time so mm-hmm. careful around the eyes yep so I think that wraps it up any other Jurassic Park thoughts mm-hmm. I did want to um deep dive the Dolby Digital maybe I'll do that for next week but just didn't have time mm-hmm. before this episode came out with all the bonus episode and all the, the craziness and everything yeah this we've been a little wonky with our schedule this week mm-hmm. or this season so um, hopefully we'll get more streamlined next season yeah, might see that next week so um any last thoughts on Jurassic Park or ready to turn the chapter? I'm ready to turn the page and move on to what are we watching tonight? Tonight we are watching Starship Troopers from 1997. It is rated R. And now let's hop into our time machine. To 1997 were the top three movies released that year or top five as you have on this list. Oh, I just have five. If I put more, it's usually because I want to talk about one of the ones in the screenshot. The top Uh, three are... Um, Men in Black grossing two hundred fifty million, Dr- The Lost World, Jurassic Park grossing two hundred twenty nine million, and Liar Liar grossing one hundred eighty one million. I just I screenshotted the top five because I thought it was interesting that Star Wars Episode Four, A New Hope, mm-hmm. was I guess re released and was in the top five still of movies seen one hundred thirty eight million theaters. dollars. Crazy. I mean, you see why they did it then if they could print one hundred thirty eight million dollars from that. Absolutely. The top three songs released that year were Candle in the Wind by Elton John, <laughs> You Were Meant for Me by Jewel, and I'll Be Missing You by Puff Daddy and Faith Evans. I feel like this is like just before our time of getting into music, like just out of what was like super pop culture in mm-hmm. our youth. Because I'm like, I mean, obviously, if you were around in 1997, you know Candle in the Wind because that stuff was mm-hmm. everywhere. Um, but the other ones, I'm like, maybe I would recognize them, but not off the top of my head. It feels wrong to me that 
Jewel, like you were meant for me, was at the same time as I'll Be Missing You by Puff Daddy and Faith Evans. Just those, it, I would have guessed the there was like a good four year gap with Jewel coming first. Mm -hmm. Just doesn't feel right for my memory of 1997. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like I was, that's when I was just, I think I got my first, like, now that's what I call music, aka the original, the first, now that's what I call music in 1997. <laughs> and that's when I kind of started to be aware of music, but it really wasn't until maybe like, Mm -hmm. 98 99 where i was really like oh this is what people are actually listening to right now i just didn't realize anyone actually bought those oh You're i have the only person i've ever met that's ever bought any of the now are you kidding me i have now now two now five now six and now nine it kind of bums me that i don't have all of them mm -hmm. but now five slaps still i think there's probably like a hundred of them now so it's disgusting how many nows there are anyways <laughs> have you seen starship troopers before i have but probably not for 20 or more years no maybe not 20 maybe between 15 and 20 years gotcha that's good to know for mm -hmm. reference when we watch it um i have not seen it i don't know anything about it and i did a really good job of not looking at anybody who was in it or the cover or anything when i was looking up what year and what it was mm -hmm. rated so i have no i assume it's science fiction i'm getting like a maybe it's like a star wars star trek like spoof thing but that's probably incorrect based on the way your face is looking right now I was just trying to remember where the whole plot and what I would categorize it as. I'm not going to say whether you're right or wrong. I'm just trying to th think what I would categorize it as. I mean, like, I don't really know. That's kind of what I'm hoping it is. Just something mm -hmm. that's like a little less like serious, but I have no idea. Yeah. So I won't spoil anything with what I know about the movie. Um, I remember bits and pieces of it, but like I said, it's been quite a long time and I was a lot younger when I watched it. But you did say that it is one that you very enjoyed, much enjoyed when you watched yes. it. And I see references to it and like memes from it all the time and just people making like, callbacks to it on like various uh reddit threads and things so i'm excited to go back and rewatch it now because when i watched it when i was younger i didn't understand most of the overall everything behind the movie i guess mm -hmm. and what, what it's what it's getting at so um that being said let's hop into the movie all right starship troopers Cheers. Welcome back. That was Starship Troopers. It certainly <laughs> was. <laughs> I can't wait to hear all of your thoughts, but firstly, I want to hear your thoughts on, on the, the wine. wine. So first we'll start with the wine scale. The wine scale is a zero to ten scale. However, this scale is heavily weighted because all the wines that we drink on this show are very good wine. So a low score does not necessarily mean that it is a very, it is not a good wine, because as I said, all the wines are very good. That being said, I'm going to rate this wine an 8.2. <laughs> um, I liked it. It just had a lot I, of good flavor. I didn't like it, but I took my last sip and I realized that I had forgotten anything that it tasted like. So I'm going to give it a 5.2. Sorry, drop my phone. My B. <laughs> I'm giving it a 5.2. Hey, I mean, not that it's a low score. I, anyway, like, I regret not overly thinking it mm -hmm. at the halfway point, which I feel like I'm usually pretty good about, but I took my last sip and I was like, oh shoot, I don't think I really have a score for it. I think if you made me blind taste test the last 10 wines we've had, this would be in the top two or three. This is- It was good. I, I mean, good, I, great wine. I have nothing against it, but I feel like I have to rate it more towards the, the center mm -hmm. mark because it didn't leave a lasting impression on me, but I did enjoy it. Yeah, great everyday uh, wine um i drank it right down yeah. it was delicious wouldn't necessarily pair it with a steak seems like it, it'd be kind of uh yeah taking a little um attention away from said steak and a little bit <laughs> too like fruity yeah for a, steak. a good everyday wine like a good like spring drinking wine yes very springy yes yeah, so um the fat boys are always great apparently you're a bit harsher of a critic on this one than i am i think it was just the situation of me not thinking halfway through i've always i've got to stop when mm -hmm. we like actually pause the movie refill the wine make the popcorn yeah and and stop and make notes and like taste it and like take a I second did, like about 80 percent the way through this movie i did come up with my scores i, I usually do it really around like the like 30 to 40 percent way through the movie and then again later to make sure that i'm mm -hmm. still thinking of that through i'm usually pretty good about it but mm -hmm. i think i've been off the last couple of weeks just so i'll let you go first for your movie score then um, I'm giving this a movie score of a 3.2. 3.2. I'm giving it a 7.2. Sevens? Yeah. All the way up into the sevens? Yeah. 
I like this movie, and it, I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more later, but um, <laughs> it has a special place in my heart. Which, the nostalgia factor, and that's why you've yes. given me a hard time for it, so mm-hmm. I can't give you a hard time for it now. But um, Some of the random quotability of it. If it's on TV, like on HBO or something, I would have watched it. I like like going back and rewatching it. And there is some cultural influence that, or that is influenced, and I will get to that in a minute, and that's why I really like this. So, um, yeah. It gets 3.2 points because it was culturally influenced by other sci-fi movies that we've seen so far. <laughs> so you're and that's going from that channel from it being influenced by, it. not influencing. Yes. All right. That's what it gets for me for this one. Well, let's go with the movie description first. Um, I will start. This takes place in some futuristic time where planet Earth is under attack by some race of bug type aliens. And it takes place in the whole like military arm of this following soldiers in various branches throughout the intergalactic whatever space force the Earth has. And they're fighting against the bugs. Yep, that's it. <laughs> going to read the movie description? I'm going to go ahead and read the description according to the TV, which says, Set in the future, the story follows a young soldier named Johnny Rico and his exploits in the mobile infantry. Rico's military career progresses from recruit to non-commissioned officer and finally to officer against... Sorry. And finally to officer against the backdrop of an interstellar war between mankind and an arachnid species known as the Bugs. I want you to know that the TV with a screensaver right in the middle of you reading that just like it used to before we took screenshots of it (laughs) i i just was perfectly timed always for just that one day i'm gonna go back through all of the 42 episodes of this Mm -hmm. and me trying to read this description and it will be a comical like Mm -hmm. blooper reel of it something always going wrong Mm-hmm. It always. At least it this is, time it was. It is an underrated, were, harder job. We've mitigated it by you taking a screenshot. Also, that but yes, yeah, I think that was a bit more flowery version of my description. A little bit, but overall, it didn't give too much. It didn't. Mm-hmm. It didn't give a lot of adjectives about each character and some like some of the other things that we've seen and like. You have to be pretty specific to give spoilers away for this. Yeah. To be honest. And it has a seven point oh star rating and a seventy two percent on Rotten Tomatoes. Well, was the movie what you expected? yes and no Mm -hmm. it felt a lot longer than i thought it was gonna be and i mean it was it wasn't super serious there it 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 kind of that's why i had to look at my face before you were trying to like say it's like a comedy i'm like i don't know if i'd call it a comedy but maybe like a satire in a way yeah it's it wasn't taking itself too seriously which i did appreciate Mm -hmm. but it just was like very long Mm -hmm. and it was kind of but but my problem with it is that it rushed a lot of details and there was no like there was no tracker of time except for the one year earlier Mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden it's like back to the year where it was but like you didn't realize the full year had passed but then like some things were explained and some things weren't explained and and i just felt like i felt lost Mm -hmm. during this i did have a note um where i asked what's the timeline here because they do talk about it going one year previous but it seems like a lot happens in that one year of them like going like to boot camp where mm-hmm. suddenly they're progressing to the ranks pretty quickly they're becoming much more like uh skilled and experienced in their craft than they should be and like they're fresh out of high school and then at the end of the movie they're like the old guys but like how much time has really passed because mm-hmm. they still look the same that like it are they like, 19 and the new recruits are 18 and like it feels like one year in a week and i i think it was trying to that part you're referencing is trying to make like the whole fact like experience ages you so much in war, but it did feel like it was kind of a questionable timeline. I just was left with more questions than answers mm-hmm. in this movie. Anyways, we will go back to our the good news is there's sequels. I just had never seen them. You haven't seen Starship Starship. I hate the name of this movie. Yes. I cannot say it. Starship Troopers 2 is not your preferred version of this movie no. because Jurassic Park 2, your favorite. Terminator 2, your favorite. I wouldn't say Jurassic Park 2 is my favorite. It's just the one that I'd seen first. And the <laughs> first one was more people. You know, I just have to give you a hard Terminator time. Terminator 2 is my favorite. And we, <laughs> I will have you watch that. It's a great movie. I, I also um, feel like I've heard you say Back to the Future 2 is the best one. It is. I'm telling you, he loves a sequel. So, sometimes sequels can be good. And I will respect when a sequel can outdo the original. Because a lot of times sequels are trash. Oh, they, a lot of times they are. But they, they, they have their moments. Okay, the, so how well did it age? I thought it aged pretty well. 
be honest. Yes. I thought the CGI was not as cringy as I thought. At the very beginning, it felt terrible. My first note is going all in with the CGI and animation. I mm-hmm. mean, it doesn't even like it. They, they kind of continue that same like mm-hmm. way of storytelling with like the, the news articles almost. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the beginning, it's like boom, 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 like super fast paced, like switching screens, animations, CGI, and all that. CGI was terrible. Like the asteroids yes, looked. The asteroids. So my first note was some real 1997s era computer graphics shit. Like it just was not yeah. it good. It felt very much like okay, someone is is really. I I saw you sitting next to, to me, being like, "Where's my phone? Where's yeah. my phone?" Because I knew we were both like, "We have mm-hmm. to make a comment." Yeah, it was it was pretty obvious there. The rest of it got so much better, and I think we're coming to realize that especially 20 plus years ago, the animatronics and puppets and everything were so much better than the CGI yes. was. Always. Nowadays, it's gotten a lot better, but I think that... I still feel like it'll always be better. Right. I, I think that CGI, if it nails it perfectly, can be better, but when CGI is just off of just enough, it's terrible compared to some pretty well-done puppets and And it can get outdated so quickly. Mm-hmm. Stop motion can is, is not great that can no. look really cringy and there were a couple of things where i saw the stop motion like when the guy gets his brain sucked out where you're telling you can tell like that's whatever pretty pretty fake but some halfway decent puppets i think will always outdo some halfway decent cgi 100 even today um could, could this, this be, be made to today sure yeah it takes place in the future i think that they probably lean a bit more into the cgi than the puppets mm-hmm. and animatronics for better or worse do they say that the title of the movie in the movie no. don't think so I don't think so. Yeah, I did not hear. I, I feel like when it's said, it's like very obvious. And when it's mm-hmm. not said, yeah. you're like, ah, maybe they did. Mm-hmm. No, it's not sure I heard either word, to be honest. No. Does the title fit the movie? I guess so. A boy's life, maybe. I mean, <laughs> was I wrong when I said that this whole mm-hmm. season is just a boy's life? Mm-hmm. We Can we re- <laughs> rebrand sci-fi season <laughs> as a boy's life? We season. need to find a good like girl-centric sci-fi movie to really like throw off this whole boy's life. I don't thing. really know that that exists. <laughs> I think sci-fi sci-fi exclusively <laughs> exists for boys. It's the patriarchy speaking, I think. Um, I think that maybe like alien bugs or something like a bit more cringy could have fit. But also, I think something leaning more. The into bugs voice. really threw me off. I was not expecting bugs mm-hmm. out like aliens sure and yes they were like alien bugs or whatever but like the fact that they were so specifically referred to as bugs was just not what mm-hmm. i was expecting for and that i do think that brought it more to the sci-fi category from than from space because i was like oh is this like are you see sure this isn't like just a space movie mm-hmm. and that definitely made it sci-fi. there's a lot of sci-fi stuff in there with the, all the warping through sp- space yeah. all the all the like new more futuristic stuff but i think they could have given a title more leaning into the military aspect of it giving it something leaning into that in a way i don't know i mean troopers i guess yeah. but like the whole like military industrial complex thing i think they were trying mm-hmm. to like satire they could have leaned in a little bit more into the, into the title but i think it's a great title for the movie to be honest yeah i will be interested to see if i come up with any other working titles in our facts next for next week we'll see were there any actors that wanted to do bigger things? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Denise Richardson. Mm-hmm. This was very, this was like her fourth or fifth movie, like pretty early on in her career. Um, Neil Patrick Harris, who I'm and pretty PH. sure was like a big child star. Child star yeah, I think this, this was point. not, it was, it, it depends on how you, what you refer to as early in his career. Mm-hmm. Given that he, he was, was 24 star. in this. He looks like he's about 14. Six, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, six, 14. <laughs> six and a dozen. <laughs> um, I will save my thoughts on him for my notes. Um, there was a uh, Michael Ironside who's played just a whole lot of character roles. He was the like sergeant, whatever that had yes, the arm yes, missing. Yes, there was the teacher. Um, he's been in a million things. Um, Seth Gilliam who played Sergeant Carver in the wire yes. was in this, who still kind of young in this and still felt kind of young in the wire, which was but filmed. They were eight not years after this that far maybe? apart in age. I guess. Yeah. It's 97, but the wire still that wire ended in 08. And it went four seasons. So five seasons? Is, five, yeah, five seasons. So it was, um, everyone forgets the second season of The Wire. It wasn't that far, but he still felt really young in except, this. Except for you because you love the sequels. No, not, not seasons. Not, not seasons. No. Se- no. Season two is not your favorite. The no. se- like second movie is your favorite. Yes. Second season is usually pretty bad because they're still trying to find themselves in most series. Okay. Next up was what impact do you think this movie had on pop culture? 
I'm going to toss this one back to you. So to be honest, I still, even to the, to literally earlier today, see references to Starship Troopers and the whole jokes of the, um, the I'm doing my part type thing. I see that, that meme all the time. And I can see that being that. used regularly in your line of work. Well, and in, in Reddit too, seeing that mm-hmm. all over the place. But to be honest, the biggest influence is, is so the first time I saw this movie, I thought that this movie was a blatant ripoff of Starcraft, the, the game, the video game by Blizzard. It, it has, um, the whole like military, um, like satire thing that this, that, that Starcraft had with the Terran race being like, Oh, we're these, you know, big, mil- you know, Marines, we're going to go, you know, attack these people. And then had this really alien race and the aliens in here feel very much similar to the Hydralisks and the Zerglings from Starcraft. And, have, I'm sorry. I'm just like and the brain melting the a little, mind little bit. Starcraft <laughs> that I was like, oh my god, this is clearly ripping it off. However, this came out before Starcraft came out, so like finding that out later, I was like, oh my god, this was actually more of the source material for that. So okay. I think this more pushed forward like that game, and I, and I really want to look through and see how much directly that that influenced the game because they were developed around the same time. But I still think that this more influenced that than the other way around. Okay. And uh, those are my two big pop culture notes for this. I can say if I have ever heard of this before Mm -hmm. this week, it's because you mentioned it sometime in the last nine years that I've known you, 10 Mm -hmm. years that I've known you. Um, I, I could see the impacts of pop culture on this movie of the sci-fi movies that came before it. Mm -hmm. I, and I, and if I'd heard of it before, it was like, Oh, Neil Patrick Harris, like loosely mentioning that he was in it in some like interview or something like nothing specific. So I didn't, I mean, I didn't know anything about it. That's why I got a three. I don't know. There's not a lot of impacts for me. Yeah. I I think I could see a lot of the influences, especially from Star Wars and Space Odyssey, like the, the Space way they Odyssey show, for sure. The way they show the, that was my first thought. Right. I definitely see that. And, and it seems like Space Odyssey just showed us what spaceships were going to look like and everyone else has just gone directly <laughs> off of that. that. Yes, copy paste. Um, but I also felt like the way they were like flying around more felt similar to Star, Star Wars, with the smaller ships mm-hmm. moving around the bigger ships and the the destroyers and all yeah. the, the fleets and her, just going like flying through the ships, like stuff. Yeah, hundred mm-hmm. percent. Um, my next question on the questionnaire is: Do you feel culture after watching it? No, no, for you. <laughs> this, I feel like this is one of the few times where I've mm-hmm. said no. Yeah, I I mostly say yes, and maybe I will feel differently a season mm-hmm. or seven from now, but right now. Yeah. I'll give it a half yes, just because I've a, already seen it. And B, I feel like the references I see online and like the memes, I don't think that it's a huge pop culture thing where a lot of things were based off of this besides Starcraft, which is larger following than you think. Um, I'll give it a half yes, relative like, to most of the other movies we've seen, especially this season. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's also hard coming after star wars and jurassic park so and back to the movies. future like we've seen some big stuff this year mm-hmm. and this year well also this, this year season. this season but in so far in 2024 mm-hmm. and this is not one of them sorry i get that that's fair i will let you go first with your notes because i went first last week i believe okay my first note was the 1997 eras uh graphics in the beginning my next note was no smartphones so it's taking place like in the future and in order to go get their grades for their academy, whatever testing, they have to go to this big giant computer bank thing and type in their name and see their like scores here. It just felt like one of those times where they're trying to predict the future, but it's so divergent from even what we have, mm-hmm. what we had in 2007 or eight from. And it, it's like predicting the future, but so rooted in what they mm-hmm. already know. Because, I mean, I've never one time looked on a piece of paper mm-hmm. for my scores. Yeah. I mean, we had computers and we looked them up on our own personal online. I can't imagine mm-hmm. the horror of being able to see everybody's grades in my class. That seems like such a personal right. violation, especially as like as a teacher. I wouldn't. I can, can't imagine just being like, children, see what mm-hmm. everybody else scored. Well, from here, what, scored. What, your, what your parents said is they had like your social security number, which seems like a huge violation. Also, so red flag. Um, but using that to be like, oh, you've got this chart of semi-anonymized numbers and you find your score there on that. But even still, I feel like in 1997, they weren't too far off from everyone having a laptop in college. Yeah. Or their own computer mm-hmm. email to go check their own scores. That it felt very like old school of like, oh, people get scores in school. They've got to go to this big giant board, check their their name on there and 
Yeah. Felt very backdated that, there. That was cringy for me, for sure. It's like, oh, we've got, it's in the future. We got all these flying spaceships everywhere, but we're also back in the 1980s on mm-hmm. how we check scores in schools. My next note was, I was getting some real Luke Skywalker vibes from Rico and his family where they're talking about, oh, like, don't go and list. Like, you need to stay here, stay with us. Like, don't go, don't go. And then he leaves and they get killed. I see that. Felt very, very reminiscent of the whole Star Wars thing. And he, he's like, really wants to go and like join and like make a, make a difference with this like freedom fighters. And uh, he leaves and his family gets killed. Yeah. I and he was a little bit whiny. Not near, I mean, right. not. N- <laughs> it, it almost seemed like he Star Wars set, would have been the satire of that. Of just, Luke Skywalker set the precedent of whiny and everybody mm-hmm. else is just like pales in comparison. For sure. Uh, my next note was the lack of timeline information where it seemed like it was really should have taken more than a year for them to have worked their way through the ranks for everything and how long they were gone and just didn't really make much sense for it being like a one year type thing and denise richardson's character just like be like being a lead pilot already Mm -hmm. that quickly that just like that doesn't track yeah also kind of tacking onto that i feel like geographical location was not really specific Mm -hmm. because i i saw buenos aires education center in the background and i was like oh like is that some like suburb of california mm-hmm. or something where they have that same name and then it was like they on the map and they were in south america and i'm like you're telling me all these people are not from the united states because i don't believe you i was like three notes down for what i have is they're supposed to be argentinian yeah like, did not feel like it at all there was they were not hispanic at all no accent no anything except for their names because i mm-hmm. looked at their names and i was like oh her name's like very exactly. like like has that like hispanic vibe to it and then I was like, okay, Rico, I guess. And then Flores. And I was, and then all of this. And I was like, wait, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. Are you trying to tell me? <laughs> I, I just, I don't the know. The whitest people ever are all Argentinian. Yeah. With no accent. Yeah. I. And they're all, and they're all talking about getting into Harvard. Mm-hmm. Harvard is not in Argentina the not, last not, time not I checked. Not really close either. That I, someone's theory on this that I saw literally, literally earlier today was that is in the future where the the world has become like more homogenized and it's just like everyone is the same and I'm like well could kind of buy that just based on like the whole you know America trying to insert their influence everywhere type thing but I uh, I did find it really funny that where they decided to really push the whole Buenos Aires thing for mm-hmm. no real reason why they yeah. couldn't have made it like I just don't Houston, understand Texas or anything or even like I mean I feel like there's so much it's like so many like um names like that in california obviously Mm -hmm. i can't think of one off the top of my head right now but there's so much of that like hispanic influence in latina Mm -hmm. influence in yeah california that like i I, valley or los angeles i assumed it was just like somewhere outside of la especially the way that rico looks like he looks Mm -hmm. like such a like a ken barbie doll straight out of like Mm -hmm. southern california and playing some american football Right. On like a basketball court or something. (laughs) Doing triple flips. I have so many questions. (laughs) Like, I don't really get it. Were they trying to show they had like technology where he could do like, like triple flips running down a football field? Or was he supposed to be some sort of freak athlete? I mean, my note about it is football, WTF, question mark, question Mm -hmm. mark, question mark. Because he would have been like the next Mike Vick if he actually could have pulled some of those moves off on a actual football field. Right. And, and. And then, then they call it back and when they're in the battlefield. And I was just like, this is this is all too much. Yeah. And the fact that their footballs are like silver and metallic because they're futuristic. Mm-hmm. <sighs> Goes from going from actual like pigskin to synthetic pigskin to silver and gold. It's the natural evolution. That's of the football. natural progression right there. Uh, oh, also someone we missed that went on to do bigger things was Dean Norris um, played one of the boot camp director people and he would played Hank in breaking bad and he's been a character actor in a whole bunch of other things so i made a note okay. of him um oh the segment where they were fighting bugs at home like scott stomping on like cockroaches after the bugs like hit america just felt very too like accurate for when like there's actually some sort of attack somewhere and people are irrationally lashing out at things that aren't directly related to the thing that attacked them. Mm-hmm. It's like after 9-11, anyone who had that all wasn't completely white, people were absolutely harassing them and doing unspeakable things to like to those <coughs> people and those families. It just felt almost too true there. It'd be like, oh, these bugs from some galaxy far, far away, we're going to go and attack our cockroaches and take it out on them. Like obviously it's a 
it's bugs, whatever. But it, I feel like it felt a little, a little too, yeah. too close to home there. If it, it felt like that combined with like, you know, what they were trying to get at during World War Two, maybe World War One mm-hmm. too, but just like do your part at home, like like the the patriotic mm-hmm. voice of everybody's joining in. That it was this weird like combination of two different time periods. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it felt very like a World War Two type. You said like you, like when what, what I imagine going to the movies was like in World War Two, where you'd have all those pre-roll of mm-hmm. propaganda. Felt very propaganda. Very much like that. Yeah. Uh, my next note was, I guess they can breathe fine on all the alien planets. That there must be the same atmosphere or something. There was, there was no mention of like oh spacesuits or research or they were like oh we're going. There's so many planets. We literally named this one planet P. Like going through the alphabet, and we're just all going to breathe fine on them. And that's been my biggest takeaway from the sci-fi season is maybe we've watched too much like The Martian mm-hmm. for All Mankind, these movies that are like rooted more in reality and science, but like fictionalized versions of what reality is. Where like this and Star Wars and a bunch of other stuff and they're just sitting around breathing and, mm-hmm. and like their spaceship gets hit and nobody is like, oh, Big I can't leak. breathe. I don't know. I, I think I just, I'm like, well, this is obviously bullshit. I don't buy it. <laughs> I'll hold my breath in space for a little while and float around or something like I that. I honestly think I also subconsciously kind of hold my breath once anything like <laughs> hits the spaceship and I, where I'm like, oh my God, mm-hmm. it's coming. Even in this movie, when I saw um, but Denise Richards' uh, spaceship got hit by something, I was like, well, oh, she's clearly gone. There's a, a crack in the glass. Mm-hmm. And then she comes back later and she's like, oh yeah, it's just like a, a minor, I've, I've got a cut on my face to show that. Like, <laughs> all of them right? should have died. Like they all, no one should still be living. <laughs> yeah. That's the moral of the story. Just uh, seemed a bit unrealistic there. Obviously it's a movie about aliens, but that part seemed a bit far-fetched to me. Uh, my next note was that I thought this was a better story than Star Wars, to be honest. It just seemed like more yeah. interesting of a story. Whereas like, oh, you're the chosen one. Your father was this bad, like villain person. Yes, I because because although it was hard to follow and like the timeline and the geography was not super explained and I mm-hmm. felt like I was still missing a lot of information, I think I was missing more information from Star Wars than I was from this. Mm-hmm. And it's easier to buy into the like teens mm-hmm. going to like fresh out of school, signing up, like you you can identify with that story a little bit like it's kind mm-hmm. of rooted in something so that they probably also is familiar is more applicable to actual real life where it's like who you know type things and working with the ranks and some stuff and it starts out like in a very like i mean obviously the clothes are different but they're in a classroom and they go to a school dance and like there's some of that where it's like i have experienced some of these same things mm-hmm. so you you identify with the characters and you understand where they're coming from that they have a home base that is similar to what you consider a home mm-hmm. base then it gets weird and then you have to like follow from there. Yeah. But you're already like more rooted in the characters whereas like Luke Skywalker's living in some like dirt hole in the ground and He's just whiny. Yeah. And like, well, I guess he should die. Yeah. But I think <laughs> I think in both movies they definitely had some pretty thick plot uh-huh. armor where in both ones you're like, I don't see why you're gonna live throughout through this. Like mm-hmm. Luke Skywalker trying to take on the Empire, this guy as like a, a grunt on the front lines, like you're not likely to survive all these things that mm-hmm. just a you know, a bit of a, a plot armor keeping them alive through all those battles. And my final note was that this was a pretty generic soundtrack. I can't even tell you anything about it. So, right. yes. I was listening to it. It was, it was the know, least whelming of any of them. Right. We've had some pretty banger soundtracks throughout this particular season, especially. And I I was listening to this being like, I, I don't really find any like notes of this being really great. It, it seemed like it was an orchestrated type soundtrack not just a bunch of like hit songs at the time or anything like that just seemed uh pretty forgettable to be honest which was surprising given all the other soundtracks i have forgotten it so it is forgettable in my book i it's not even ringing a bell as soon as you said it i was like oh crap i don't remember Mm -hmm. (laughs) and i think that kind of also like speaks to my like cultural significance like a lot of these other Mm -hmm. movies i didn't love but i'm like but i know the soundtrack but like i know this and this one i'm like yeah yeah i get that not for me. All right, you ready for me to dive into my notes? Go for it. Uh, so I talked about the CGI, um, and then my next note is Denise Richardson and Neil Patrick Harris, but I'm going to talk about Neil Patrick Harris for a second. I just think he is a very one-dimensional actor. Like, I just kind of feel like he is always like, the same, like a different version smart, of the same thing. Type guy. Yeah. From everything that I've seen him in, it's always the same kind of character. Mm-hmm. 
And, you know, it's, it is a type of character. It's great. And he's good at it. Mm -hmm. But I also like, I don't know. I just don't buy his cockiness all the time. I, I enjoy him. It's not that I dislike him, mm-hmm. but I, the more I see him, I'm just kind of like, I don't know how I feel about it. It's funny because it's like, yeah, if you're good at what you do, keep doing what you're doing. But also you look at him and you're like, I don't really buy you being that like cocky, arrogant type, you know, self-confident, like really um, mm-hmm. out there person. It's, and I mean, I'm a big How I Met Your Mother person. It's not my mm-hmm. favorite show, but I mean, I listen to it a lot. It's an easy background show. And I don't know. I just like, I just don't buy him as Barney Stinson at all. Mm -hmm. Like his, his acting of the character is great, but I don't buy him as the character. It's almost funny because he's does not fit the character. Yeah. And I, and then you see this obviously before he was Barney Stinson Mm -hmm. and, but it's still like elements of that. And I'm like, I just still don't think I really buy it. Mm -hmm. I like you a lot. You're fine, but eh, not for me. I'd like to see a little bit more range. Push yourself. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, my next note is they're dissecting these bugs, not wearing gloves. WTF? Mm-hmm. Like, are you kidding me? Ugh, like, you don't even know what's in there. Mm-hmm. And you're just sticking. Ugh. Mm-mm. Yeah. Also, like, where they get the bugs, like, I don't know how they got these and, like, preserve them and everything, but are they not concerned that there's, like, really, like, acid or really harmful right? things? Like, these bugs right? are literally attacking trying to kill them and have yeah. all these weird, like, blue shit. They're firing at spaceships. And there's, like, yeah, we're just gonna have a bunch of students just go ahead and try to cut these things up and, yep. uh, good luck. Yep. Yes. Gross. Mm-hmm. And then on that same note, though, the... I hope they actually like, chloroform them, though, like an E.T. Oh, go right there. <laughs> I, I'm glad that you mentioned it while we were watching it because it did make me laugh. Um, but the, um... The teacher in that class, I felt like, you know, with the glasses on and stuff, just felt like this very, like, caricature of a scientist. Mm -hmm. Um, Almost, like, a little bit gave me some, what, Dexter's Laboratory vibes. Just, like, some some of that, like, like mad scientist characteristic. She should have spoken with, like, a thick German accent the way she was looking. But whilst skimming the Wikipedia page trying to figure out who everybody in this was, that was played by Rue McClanahan from The Golden Girls. I never saw the Golden Girls. Nor have I, but she is a Golden Girl. Got it. She is one of the Golden Girls playing this weird little mad scientist with her yeah. glasses. Some rough skin in that, but yeah. Yeah. Um. So I just thought that was an interesting character because I mean, mm-hmm. I, I was like, who is this eccentric like caricature of a person? Turns out it's a pretty famous person. Uh, my next, I mean, I talked about football. Mm-hmm. Who even knows what's going on there? That was weird. And like the fact that Dizzy was able to just like knock the guys over. But they were mm-hmm. they were like able to like flip each other in the air. It, it, it the actual like power dynamic didn't really like, make sense. This is weird, like uh, anti gravity thing going on in the field. Yeah, that it felt like there was a little something extra. Yeah, it was it was weird. The main my next note is the main guy Rico, Rico was played by Casper Van Dien Van okay. Dien. Sure, how is he not in more like rom commy stuff in the nineties mm-hmm. early two thousands? Like he is. Exactly what they are looking for. With a really the, strong the chin. jaw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the chin and the nice hair. He also kind of reminded me of um, in Legally Blonde, her Warner. Um, Elle Woods is like love interest of Warner. Mm-hmm. Just like that very, like he went to Harvard and they, he was talking about going to Harvard and I was like, oh my God, is he played by the same person? But just that like very like Ken doll looking person what that I'm shocked from, he's not uh, more. The Notebook, um, James Marsden. Marsden. I said yeah. Marsden. Marsden. Yes. I, I got those kind of vibes from him. Like yeah, a, he has uh, that like the charisma of him. Um, but he's much more like rough mm-hmm. in like a sexy way. Yeah. I mean, I think it's more what he was playing mm-hmm. for, for yeah. sure. And I, I was just shocked to see that he wasn't like a bigger star because I think, mm-hmm. I mean, like it's not that he was a bad actor. I think it was kind of a weird movie to like have strong acting credits for. Mm-hmm. But I mean, he was the lead in this and just, I was like, oh, like he has to have been in something else. Like he has to have been a big thing. And he was, he was in some like soap operas and stuff, which he like, you -hmm. could very much fit into the soap opera gig with that look. But I I don't know. I was just shocked that he wasn't in more. Okay. My next note is we were kind of, you were kind of talking about this during the movie and I was trying to save it for the end. Um, The guy who is fighting for Cameron Xander, Mm -hmm. like wants her love interest. I think he should have been played by Walton Goggins. Okay, so I see that. I was you like, see where I'm coming from, though, right? I was thinking more of the Rob Lowe 
Five. You said Rob Lowe, and I, I, I do see that. Mm-hmm. But I was watching this guy, especially certain angles, and I was like, is it Walton Goggins? I mean, I kind of had convinced myself it was him, and then I obviously it's not. Yeah. But He'd be much older. If you told me that he was like the love child of Rob Lowe and Walton Goggins, I'd be like, yeah, it makes sense. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, he just, I don't know. <laughs> Very different actors. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Rob Lowe and Walt well, Goggins well, are very Billy. different. Um, yeah, I I see what you're getting at, mm-hmm. but I I don't think it would. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it would have be been a, a very slight movie but, if he was in. But this. he's he's so like charming, like like the characters he plays mm-hmm. tend to be very charming and very kind of sneaky, and and there was something about like the way he smiled, and I think like that where you knew he was up to something. Where mm-hmm. it just I don't know, gave me his vibes. I also feel if uh, Walton Goggins was playing or was playing football in a movie he would have been like running through a trick play where he actually didn't get touched because otherwise he would have been absolutely rocked 100 percent. oh i mean especially like if you think of his character from vice principles like mm-hmm. he's not a football player yeah but something about him and like especially as the like fighter pl- pilot i totally mm-hmm. bought into um and then my last note is <laughs> another open cup when they're when uh, Xander and Carmen are in the spaceship and he brings her a cup of coffee Mm -hmm. and it's used as a visual like oh something's going on but first of all he hands her that and I'm like like, before I even saw that and I'm like it's it's whatever future year Mm -hmm. that it is how are you not drinking out of some kind of like fancy travel top cup like a cup with Mm -hmm. a top mug not this open coffee mug in the middle of the spaceship see-through so they can obviously see the whole yeah. like coffee tilting thing. But I'm looking, I was looking at it and being like, hmm, that looks like one of those weird like see-through like f- fancy espresso mug things people people have. It seems very impractical to have those on a spaceship. Yeah, and it was. It'd be a paper cup, if anything, on a spaceship like that or on a, on a ship. A hundred percent. And like the dishes you'd have to do. I don't know. I just, as soon as they he walked in carrying them, I was like, I hate this choice. Mm-hmm. But... Um, I feel like I had more to say about it, but I, th- I think we've kind of already talked about it. like the geography. I meant to, I wanted to bring that back and um, Neil Patrick Harris is acting. Mm-hmm. Also, Denise Richardson. Richards. Richards. Sorry. Denise Richards. She, uh, I didn't really buy her in this role as the, like the brainy, mm-hmm. like pilot, the girl that's going to become a, a lead pilot in this Troopers, she especially terrible troopers. in the beginning. Her acting was terrible. I didn't notice as much later because she was in it a bit less and not trying to mm-hmm. play anything serious. I buy her as the smart girl, or I mean, or as the like I I want to succeed girl. Mm-hmm. I don't buy her as the ambitious career military life is for me mm-hmm. kind of girl. I don't I don't know. She seemed like she th- would have thrived as the and not to like go straight back to the love actually thing of like the sexy one, which she, which what she played in love mm-hmm. actually that in the beginning where she's like flirting with him in class, it mm-hmm. seemed really well doing really well there. It, it was a bit awkward or cringy when she was trying to be mm-hmm. super brainiac there I I was say. that it, it somewhat reminded me of the whole, like, I, I don't know what it was about like the nineties with like the Jurassic park thing of like, Oh, we have to have girl hackers. Mm hmm. Like the girls are going to be the really smart ones there that it seemed like it was really forcing that. And it mm-hmm. wasn't a good actress in either case to really play that or convince us of that. I agree. And I think kind of back to what you're talking about, like the nineties, I think what I did like about this movie is that it was a nice combination of like nineties. It's not a rom-com by any means, mm-hmm. but like that feeling of, especially in the beginning of, you know, being in class and like the jock and the cheerleader where you're like, okay, this is familiar. I've seen this before. Mm-hmm. That That's kind of like inviting. Then And then obviously it mixes into this like whole other genre, but I, I did appreciate that it was, I think because we've been really deep in the like sci-fi stuff mm-hmm. that to kind of deviate from that a little bit was really nice. And just the like, very 90s aspects of it obviously it was like a futuristic 90s but mm-hmm. it was the 90s when you're watching um, it it was very it much was 90s. <laughs> very much 90s which was nice and especially like we've been watching like the 80s stuff so to, to kind of really progress into the 90s was really cool so that all we have i guess that wraps up starship troopers starship troopers that's all my notes so we will be back next week with a new movie yes we are not done yet mm-hmm. we have i believe we'll still be in the 90s 
Yes, we will still be in the 90s. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm actually excited for next week. Yes. And I mean, this one was kind of a last minute add in, so I didn't mm-hmm. have much time to think about this one. But this this next one, I've been waiting to see for a while. I'm excited too because I haven't seen it in a while, but we'll get to that next yes. week. All right. So thank you for watching. If you are enjoying the podcast, if you can rate and review wherever you get your podcasts, or if you're watching us on YouTube, if you would subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so you can get notified when we post new videos. If you have any thoughts on our science fiction season, or if you have rom-com movie suggestions for our next season coming up in just a couple weeks, you can leave a comment or you can message us on Instagram at culture night pod, or you can email us at culture night pod at gmail.com. Uh, any other thoughts, questions, comments, send them there, send us to all the places Mm -hmm. and we look forward to seeing you next time. Cheers. Cheers.